Hello everyone. Uh, we're going to get started today on how to develop an effective CV for healthcare. My name is Ashley Risotto and I am a career advisor with the Office of Career Development at Nova Southeastern University. Just a little background about me. I started working here about five months ago, immediately after graduating with my master's degree in higher education from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And before that, I was a Brooklyn, New York native. So I've lived a couple different places and found my way to sunny Florida. And I'm happy to be here today talking to you about your CV writing skills. So when it comes to the introduction to the CV, um, actually, before we jump in, if you do have any comments, I have a chat box on the side, so feel free to chat in for those of you that are not viewing with Sheena's class. And for those of you with Sheena's class, feel free to share your comments with her and she'll type them in, or we can save our questions for the end and do a Q&A there. Whenever you want to chime in, please let me know. Um, so now back to our presentation, the introduction to CV. So the difference between a CV and a resume is that CVs are focusing on you as a scholar and a professional. They take a longer span of pages. Resumes, typically, you'll hear a limit of one to two pages. When it comes to a CV, you can go as many pages as you need to represent all of your academic accomplishments and professional accomplishments. What should you include on your CV? That we're going to be spending the bulk of the presentation today exploring the different headings and items that you can be including, as well as how to optimally include that information. The purpose of the CV is to create a professional document that highlights your strengths and qualifications. And then when we look at using the CV for all of the same jobs, you are gonna be using all of your experiences but maybe the way that we organize the content may change based on the opportunities that we're applying to. Finally, would you include mission trips or community involvement? And the answer is of course. These are great experiences to show commitment to your field. And today we are taking a healthcare look at this. So you'll find many of the examples pertain to different healthcare experiences. All right, so we just reviewed the difference between resume and CV. Um, the style is the same, but the content is different. So CVs are going to be a bit more comprehensive. They're used in many health professions, academia, and research. Those are the primary times that you will see the CV document. Resumes are basically used for everything else. You'll see it more commonly with the standard job or internship search for fields outside of health, academia, and research. Also to note, we should not be confusing this with an international CV. Um, international CVs, that is the term for resume internationally, is CV, which is curriculum vitae. Um, in America, we have a distinction between the concept of CV and resume. When it comes to your CV, there are three areas that we want to hone in on today to make sure that you have the best document to put forward, starting with the format. So we want to be able to present the information on your resume in a clear and consistent manner so that it becomes easy for employers to be able to skim that information and find exactly what you're trying to share with them. Next, the style of it. So being able to combine the format that we create, the way we set it up, as well as the information that we're putting into it to overall present to you as the best as we can on a piece of paper. And then the content, of course, is going to be delving into all those different areas of experiences that you have and organizing those pieces of content so that you are able to best present your experiences. Starting with the format, with each section on your resume, starting, um, sorry, on your CV, when it comes to your education, any clinical experiences, shadowing or mission trips, every section will be reverse chronological order. So you'll be able to start with the most recent experience and work your way backwards. The paper margins along the sides, go ahead into Microsoft Office or whichever format you're using and select the narrow margins. That gives you 0.5 margins all the way around the document, letting you use as much of the space as possible on that page. We recommend using a font size of 10 to 12. 
Um, if it's smaller than 10, it's much harder to read. And larger than 12, you start to waste space that could be squeezing in more of that relevant information right onto that first page. And then being consistent. So making sure that when we bold different areas, when we include your date, that we are doing it the same exact way all the way through the document, it becomes a much more professional, much clearer document to read when we do those things. Next, with the CV style, our do's is creating your own letterhead. So at the top of your document, and we'll have some examples following, you'll have your name as well as some relevant contact information. If you happen to submit anything other than a CV, maybe like a cover letter to go along with it, you wanna make sure that you're copy and pasting that same heading over to that other document so you get to have this professional letterhead and show a consistency across your documents. Next, using bolding, italics, and capitalizations to emphasize what's most important. And that will talk through some of the best um, roles or positions or opportunities to bold to catch attention where we want the reader to look. Next, printing on one side of the sheet. It's just a lot neater to be able to do that and using high quality resume paper, um, especially if we're gearing up for a job fair or internship fair, being able to put our best foot forward and being able to present the best possible document. Next, on the don't side, we don't wanna use more than two type styles. It gets a little confusing and it catches eyes very often when you use two different styles of fonts on the same document. Also, being careful to not crowd your resume with too much information. We'll go over some bullet point structuring later on that will help you be clear and concise and also give very high quality information. We also don't wanna use I, me, or my on this document. Um, that's more so for a cover letter or a personal statement that goes along with these different applications you may be going through. Um, this is more of a professional fact sheet. When we look at the cover letter and those other documents, there's usually more space to provide a narrative. And that's where that I, me, and my comes in. So as we were talking about the heading, with your heading for your document, you want to make sure that you're having four main components on there. That's going to be your name, of course, your address, and that could be a full address, just as we have 32 Dental Way, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, or if you're more comfortable with just putting your city, state, and zip code, that is also a completely viable option, since we know many of these applications, if not all, will be electronic. Um, additionally, along with your address and name, you need to put your most up-to-date phone number, and a professional email address. We don't wanna have babycakes27 at gmail.com being the person that uh, employer is seeing an email coming from or sending an email to. It uh, does not send the best impression, so we wanna make sure we're holding up professionalism in all of the platforms that we utilize. And that goes into LinkedIn. If you happen to have an online portfolio or a LinkedIn profile, as long as it's something that you've kept up to date with and you're proud of the information on there, um, it's a great way to insert that into your heading and steer traffic in that direction when you're looking for a job or a new opportunity. All right, so moving on from the headings, we're going to actually um, talk about the education section first. When it comes to our education section, before we even jump into the content, we wanna focus on that word education right there. Each of our headers for each section should not be bolded. Oftentimes we'll bold this because we think, okay, each new section has to draw attention to it. We wanna save that bolding and use it very strategically. So you'll see throughout the uh, talk today that we're bolding the really important information. So by using all capital letters and underline for each of our heading sections allows us to draw attention, but not as much attention or take away from the degrees that we are listing. So when it comes to your education section and those details, you wanna make sure to be bolding your degree first and foremost. Underneath your degree and spelling out, if you need to spell out um, any information, um, underneath you would put the institution in italics. So bolding our primary information and then italicizing the secondary information. All the way on the right side, now this will create balance on your page, on your resume you'll be able to provide the date of graduation, 
along the same line as your degree, and then underneath that, the city and state where you are receiving that um, degree. And this follows the reverse chronological order, so your bachelor's before that or any other previous degrees, if you would, if you are have an associate's and you're earning your bachelor's at this time, that's totally fine to have both on there. But once you've completed your bachelor's, you can feel free to take that um, associate's uh, degree off of there. Some of the potential headings when it comes to a CV. There is no right way to build the perfect CV. It's all about the experiences that you have and bring to the table. And those experiences, when you sit down and look back at all the different areas that they cover, it's about branding it the right way and using these different headings that are headed in front of you on the screen to help you organize that information. So on CVs, oftentimes you'll see sections for publications and presentations, research and clinical experience. And the way that you provide these headings would be in an order based on what you're applying for. If you're looking for a job in the healthcare field, right after your education section, which I encourage education as the first section on every document, would be probably your clinical experiences and shadowing experiences, depending on where you have the most exposure. Moving into another very important section is licensure and certification. So when it comes to this, if you have a licensed exam that provides you a number, so I know the um, NCLEX does provide a number with a certification, um, you can just provide that number directly on the right side after listing what you are certified for on that first section in bold, our most important information. Secondary being who is the accrediting institution, being able to provide that in italics, and then at the end, the number. For all of these other pieces of information, basic life support, for example, um, if it is a current licensure or certification that you have, it doesn't matter to say exactly what date you started or how long you've had it. The most important thing is if it is current to be able to provide that information. Next, going into clinical experiences. When it comes to structuring your clinical experiences, the best way to organize that information is considering bolding the area in which you receive that clinical experience. So it gives a quick overview of the areas in which you had that. So from internal medicine here at the Memorial Hospital down to a family medicine clinical over with a private DO. Next, as we did with the education section, we want to make sure that our dates are on the right side as well as the city and state. When it comes to the bullet points, you typically want to stick between three to five bullet points per experience. We'll be spending some time on a slide later on going through the breakdown of each of these slides and each of these points um, and just being able to build a specific um, and skill oriented CV. Just heard a noise here, so I may have a comment. All right, I do not. I'm going to keep on moving forward then. All right, so additional experiences. If you happen to have healthcare experiences that are not exactly clinical, feel free to include those as well, as goes teaching experience, since we do find CVs teeter on the academic side as well. When it comes to these headings, be targeted with them. Give them the names that best capture what you're trying to accomplish with that section. Sometimes reading a job description, being able to see that they're looking for healthcare and clinical experience, as well as teaching experience, for example, with these that three that we have seen so far, target to that. Build each of your headers based on what they're looking for and filling it with relevant information if you so happen to have that relevant information. And so just like we saw at the last slide, you want to put your position bolded. And then this is going to be the organization is going to be in italics, so organization or company. Same goes down here when we see science tutor in the bold. And then we see our high school here, St. Brendan High School in italics. Next, another thing that's really important to consider when we have healthcare experience and we're pursuing to move forward in that field is including any type of leadership or professional affiliations. If you have a leadership experience, go ahead and claim that position that you held in bold. 
And then underneath, as the organization or company, you'd be italicizing the name of that club that you are a part of or organization. Same rule goes here when it comes to leadership. You can spend three to five bullet points sharing the skills that you gained from it. Or if you feel you already have a lot on your resume, feel free to just provide this information, the top four pieces, and, be, and continue to list those experiences following. That would follow more of the format down here where we have professional affiliations. So maybe you would bold president right before, in italics have the student physician assistant association NSU, and the dates over on the side. Community involvement, as we said before, and mission trip experience are both highly valuable. When you think about what it takes to be in healthcare, at the end of the day, it's about being able to give back, connecting locally, and making a difference on that community local level. So we want to make sure that that's stuff that we are highlighting. Even if it was a one-day thing that you were involved with, the fact that you were involved and it gave you something, you were able to walk away with a skill and experience a story, that is the information that we want to be able to provide on your CV, especially if you find that it's relevant to what you are applying for, such as these examples here that include the Special Olympics and the Reach Fair. When it comes to mission trip experience, um, with the setup of that section, you may want to start right away with the mission trip where you went, being able to bold that information. Then following, you can give the information volunteer medical professional, volunteer dental professional, or any other title you may have held. But get specific. Don't just say volunteer. Give a little more information as to what you fulfilled while you were there. Next up, presentations and publications. All of these are to be formatted in APA style. So if you happen to have anything published, if you were part of one, a supporting author in a published article or anything like that, feel free to list it here in that manner. Um, and I'll, I have sent the PowerPoint over to Sheena Zimmerman for those of you attending who have not, are not part of that class or group. Um, I'm happy to take, give my email at the end. You can shoot me an email. I'm happy to send this along as an example for you to look at. Um, it's always good with presentations, publications, and research to include at least one bullet point summarizing what you did. And the more specific, the better. Being able to say the specific skills of producing data and analysis or researching the role of genetics in the growth of all of this information that you'll see ahead of you helps the employer hone in on exactly what you got out of that experience. So specifics are always helpful when it comes to bullet points, but especially when it comes to research assistance, presentations, and publications, since the title sometimes can only tell us so much. And that's exactly why we have two examples down here in the research section. You can go ahead and just put research assistant, name the doctor that you worked under, and give the information there. Or if you want to give some more specific information, Consider bolding the title or a summarized title of the research that you are supporting. So here we see role of genetics in the growth of craniofacial complex. And then you would just include research assistant down at the bottom where you also included the doctor's information. Professional development is also worth listing. So along with your professional affiliations where you may say that you're part of an organization, if you've attended a conference with them, feel free to list that as a separate experience. Um, presenting at conferences is also very valuable and another way to leverage the professional experiences and development that you've been receiving. Uh, additional headings that we did not go over but are all very similarly formatted is shadowing experiences, honors and awards, relevant projects or past experiences, exploring other potential headings, and we have a list on our website. So some of you may have gone through Handshake today to access this training link. Some of you may not have, but that's all right. I hope that you all have at some point interacted with Handshake, which is the Career Development Office's online portal. On that portal, we have many resources, and I'll go into that at the end, including one that lists off just a bunch of potential headings. So you can look through that and maybe find some inspiration and say, wow, maybe that is something I can include on my CV. All right, so now that we've talked about the formatting and went through many different examples, 
of ways that we can provide those experiences and set those up. We now can focus on the content piece, the actual bullet points that help display the skills that we've gained, the impacts and results that we've gained, and really display those transferable skills that we are striving to show we've accomplished. So we have this uh, system called the PAR statement, project action and result. When it comes to building a bullet point, you can break down each point into these three sections. Our project is exactly what we were accomplishing. Maybe it's the subject we were impacting if it was a group of people, or it was a collaboration right here, such as worked with community health organizations. The action, this is exactly the transferable skill we're trying to communicate. So this could be led and managed, could be assessed, analyzed, developed, there are so many different skills that we can hone in on, and this is actually the action is where we start. So even though we call it a PAR statement, we actually are going in alphabetical order. We go action, project, and then finally end with our result, which tells us not just what we did, but what came of what we had set up. So putting it all together, we have led and managed a team of 15 people from various community health organizations in developing an educational program to educate youth on preventable illnesses such as diabetes. So as you see here in the result, we didn't go that far into detail as you'd see with our final bullet point here, but take that extra step, quantify what you can, such as the 15 people we have here, and then also provide as much detail on the impact so that people can see really what you were able to walk away with. Quantifying is very important when it comes to our bullet points. The difference of interacting with 15 people versus 50 people is shows the different capacity that you have within the skill set that you're providing. So conveying that size and scale, whether it's a project, a budget, patient interaction, it creates a stronger impression. So as you see with our before and after scenarios here, there's a difference between saying performing a multitude of osteopathic manipulation techniques and seeing the more specific performed and gained an understanding of a multitude of these techniques, including the list that we have at the bottom of that bullet point here. So being able to get specific at the end or quantify by providing numbers, maybe it's assessed and reviewed 12 patients per shift. We can use that number, maybe it's a per week basis or a per month basis based on the opportunity, but being able to quantify in any way conveys a clear message. Also avoiding jargon. So one piece of it is thinking about who's looking at your CV, who's the employer or consumer on that other side, and are the acronyms you're using something that they will know? So for example, Nova Southeastern University, uh, abbreviating with NSU is acceptable as long as you've spelled it out somewhere before. It's, an a it's similar to the APA rule when it comes to abbreviations. As long as the first time you're mentioning the institution or mentioning a degree, for example, Doctorate of Osteopathic Medicine, if you add those parentheses at the end with the abbreviation you'd like to use moving forward, you are allowed to abbreviate in the rest of the document. But if you're mentioning one time BLS, basic life support, for your certification, you want to spell that out and make sure they know clearly what you are, the what the information is that you're sharing. Things to avoid. Redundancy when it comes to length. There is no page limit when it comes to CVs. I've seen CVs that are four pages long. I've seen CVs that are 12 pages long from some of the higher up academics that I've interacted with. So it's just the matter of what relevant information and experiences you have that you are bringing to the table. When it comes to, just be careful of being redundant. If you don't wanna repeat a same experience in multiple areas, even if it fits in those different headings that we're using. Instead, if you have an in, something that's healthcare and clinical experience, and maybe was also a leadership experience, you wanna put that one experience in the heading and area where it is the most relevant and will do the most benefit for you. Style changes in font and margins, like we said earlier, stick with the same font, use the 0.5 margins all the way around each of your pages, 
and it'll be clear and easy to read. When it comes to personal information, we know sometimes with international CVs, you are expected to include things such as your age, picture, and marital, marital status or citizenship. That is not a requirement when it comes to the American job search, the American CV. So when it comes to that personal information, like we reviewed before, all you need is your name, a relevant a current address, a professional email, and your phone number. And also you want to avoid irrelevant or unprofessional information. If you're volunteering and you find that it's something that does give you a transferable skill. For example, I volunteer with a cat cafe and I work as a career advisor. I'm going to keep the cat cafe on there because I'm doing valuable work with interacting with people, trying to encourage them to adopt cats, educating them on the ways to best take care of their new cat. So that's a great way for me to say, oh, I can also use these in the field of career advising because I'm building rapport with my students the same way that I build rapport with people who walk into the cat cafe. So take that lens and step back when you look at some of your experiences and say, is this really relevant? Does this relate? And is it important for me to keep? If you already have four pages, if I had a four page CV and that cat cafe was putting me on the fifth page, I'd probably just take it off. But if I only had a handful of experiences and there was still value in the skills that I was getting from that not exactly fitting experience, I could still put that in. So when it comes to the Office of Career Development and conducting your job search, our office does not just help when it comes to building your CV. We do so much more. Basically, any step you could think of when it comes to a job or internship search and exploring different professional networks. So if you're looking to network at a conference, we can talk through different ways to break the ice. If you're starting your job search, we can give you different strategies when it comes to where to look, how to look, how to reach out through informational interviews and build connections, and really how to help you feel confident in approaching the search, approaching the interview, and hopefully landing that dream job. We also do mock interviews through that, we help with building LinkedIn if you're looking to build your social network and being able to build that professional presence online. And we also highly recommend using thank you letters when you engage in job interviews, internship interviews, anything of that sort. And we're happy to help you draft those if you're a little iffy about that. So that was a whole lot of information that I put in your direction over this past half hour. I'm gonna go ahead and open my chat box here. But if you need to contact my office at any time, contact myself. I have my email right there, arizoto at nova.edu. Feel free to email me on that if you want this presentation today and don't have access to it. Um, if you need any other information from the Office of Career Development, if you want to make an appointment with us, we do phone appointments, Skype appointments, and in person. You can call that number below, 954-262-7201 and we'll be happy to schedule some time with you. So thank you all so very much for listening in today and I am now open for questions. If you do have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat box. I'll hang out here for a minute, just let people gather their thoughts and maybe think of something. And if not, then we'll wrap up. Um, yes, Ashley, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, um, can you repeat your yes. question? Um, should, when we list our education and degrees, should that remain chronological even if we have a higher level degree previously? So um, you do want to stick to reverse chronological for experiences, but when it comes to education, you can feel free to organize it by level of degree. So example, if it was doctorate, master's, bachelor's, and maybe you've went back for another master's degree, you can organize it by doctorate first, master's, master's, bachelor's, or you can put the most recent one. There's no right way when it comes to that. It just depends on which is the most relevant and important for what you're searching for. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem.
Um, and Ashley, the other um, just question that we had was about the PowerPoint and whether they can get a copy. And um, I do have the copy that you had had emailed to me and I have the attendee list. So I'd be happy to just get that to our group. Yeah, absolutely. Please feel free to share this um, this PowerPoint with your students, with anybody who wasn't able to make it today. We've actually been recording this session. So hopefully once we have it all saved, we'll be able to upload it somewhere within Handshake. So if anyone who wants to come back and hear some of the comments along with these slides, um, we're happy to um, go over that and make that accessible. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. The only and we thing Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say the only thing on your copy is my email address is not on the copy that I sent you. I had just added that in this morning. So, okay. But you feel free to share my email address with any of your students who are looking to get connected with our office. Okay, we'll do. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have another question. Wonderful. Hi. In the PowerPoint, I saw you said that it's not good to include personal information mm -hmm. unless you're like an international. Um, citizen or something. Mm -hmm. um, well, as an international student and I'm applying for a job, should I need my picture since I'm applying in the U.S. or should I not since it's not required here? So to clarify with that, um, if you are job searching within the U.S., you do not need the, any of that information on there on your resume. Um, if you were getting your education here and then going job searching across Europe, for example, you can go ahead and you'd probably have to do a little bit of research on what their expectations are for an international CV where you are searching. But for the time being, you don't have to worry about any other personal information other than your name, address, phone number, and email. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Sure. Um, if you have mission trip experience, but it's not necessarily medical related, should you still include that? Is that kind of one of those things that if you have room to include it or? It's completely up to you. If you can look at that and find some capital R relevance in the skills that you gained from that experience, I think it's worth putting on there. Specifically when it comes to mission trips, even if it wasn't in a medical capacity, that still is some sort of community engagement that I think is valuable to showcase when you're in the healthcare field. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Really good questions. Yeah, fantastic questions. I, I think that's all for us, Ashley. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you all so much for listening in today. I greatly appreciate having an audience and being able to share just a little bit of what we do over at Career Development. Of course. Thank you, Ashley. And, and um, again, I'll, I'll send the PowerPoint copy to all of our attendees here in the room, um, and I'll include your contact information in that message as well. Okay, wonderful. And if you could pass along your attendance list or just email me the number of attendees in total. Um, sure. I that to put into our system for the future. Sounds good. We had a few more join. I think we were up to 15 or 16. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. All right. Well, I hope you all have a fantastic day and a great weekend. You too. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.